Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. Today marks the start of Iowa History Month programming for 2022. Join us each Thursday for an Iowa History 101 webinar, which focuses on Iowa history through a cultural history lens. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our um, website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about the place of pigs in the American landscape, diet, and economy from the author of Capitalist Pigs, Pigs, Pork, and Power in America. And this book won the inaugural Dorothy Schweder Excellence in Research Award. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came onto this webinar with mute and cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Leo Landis, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Joe Anderson. Joe is a professor of history at Mount Royal University located in Calgary, Alberta. Prior to earning his PhD at Iowa State University, he spent many years working in public history, most notably at Living History Farms in Urbandale, where he was the director of history and interpretation. His first book was The Industrialization of the Corn Belt, Agriculture, Technology, and Environment, 1945 through 1972. And he is the author of numerous other publications, including an edited collections titled The Rural Midwest Since World War II. In 2020, he was honored to receive the inaugural Dorothy Schweder Excellence in History Research Award for his book, Capitalist Pigs, P Pigs, Pork, and Power in America, published by West Virginia University Press. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Joe to begin the webinar. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Leo, for managing the things on the back end. And may I be one of the first to wish you all happy 175th anniversary uh, to all of friends and future friends in Iowa. Uh, this is a great honor to me to be recognized uh, with the Schweder Prize. And uh, I, I had a chance to get to know Dorothy Schweder a little bit. Uh, many of you who are interested in history know the long, uh, long shadow uh, that she's cast, the big shoes she left to fill, and it's really a treat to be associated uh, with her. Anytime your name shows up in association with Dorothy Schweder, it's a good day. So I want to thank the Department of Cultural Affairs and the State Historical Society of Iowa uh, for the, the, the honor. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to join you today. I, I wanna do a couple things. I wanna talk a little bit about research before I jump into uh, the pigs portion. Since this uh, is in recognition of a research award, it seems fitting to do so. Uh, this project, this book came out of my original research project that I did for my PhD. And I was finding mountains of evidence that was all very interesting that didn't have a place in that uh, book manuscript. Uh, so I started collecting it, putting it aside, knowing that I'd come back to it later. And when I finished my dissertation and was moving on with revisions for making the book, I found a way to use them. I took some of the things that were related to food and published a book chapter on that. And even that wasn't enough. Um, I gathered material by visiting archives at Kansas State, obviously at Iowa State University, at Ohio State, and had friends from around the country send me tidbits from their archival visits. Uh, so there was a real collaborative process uh, in doing the research. There are many, many published primary sources. Uh, those, the kind of grist of the mill of historians, uh, the diaries, the letters, uh, those historic diaries allowed me to see uh, how pork production changed on individual farms, people's butchering practices, uh, the, all the issues of chasing down hogs through the woods, uh, constructing buildings to house those animals, uh, and including in the case of 
uh, Harry Truman uh, having his hogs decimated by hog cholera. All those things show up in diaries and letters and they are amazing. Uh, another great source were all of the books published not only by the government of the United States, but the state agricultural experiment stations published tremendous volumes about swine nutrition, about housing, uh, about all of the living conditions, sanitation. Uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds of those books. Many of them are found on Internet Archive. And if you haven't been using Internet Archive, I encourage you to do so. Uh, you'll, you'll go down a rabbit hole and you might come up a week later, but uh, there are great materials there. Uh, digitized newspapers allowed me to see the experience of Hartford, Connecticut and Los Angeles, California and New York City, Brooklyn, New York, in addition to the sources that I had that were rooted in the Midwest. Uh, really the most prominent collection uh, for this project was the Farm, Field and Fireside digitized newspapers uh, hosted at the University of Illinois. And they have taken farm periodicals from across the country, scanned them and made them searchable. And there are many, many great things about rural life and culture. And you can see all the debates that were happening around pigs and their place uh, on the table and in the barnyard. So that I just wanted to give you a quick overview that, uh, that there are great sources out there. And I will be the first to say that what my book does is really scratch the surface. Giving, giving the reader 400 years in a very short period of time uh, is, uh, is an introduction. And uh, I've just included a little bit of the cover here. Uh, the take home is there's no substitute for visiting archives, but uh, all of those new digitized resources really make it a fascinating new world to do history research from the comfort of your own home. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about pigs and pork. And while some of it will tie to Iowa, I really thought this might be a good chance for Iowans, who I presume are most of our audience, to see a little bit about how, uh, how this world that stretches beyond Iowa, where's Iowa's place in it? So I'll, I'll dip into Iowa a few times. Uh, but we'll also see some things uh, that happen across the country in the remaining 43 minutes of our time together. So uh, we're off to the races. And I really want to invite you to think about pigs a little differently than maybe you're used to doing. Uh, you know, pigs have been the butt of many, many jokes. Uh, they have been disparaged. Think about he's as greedy as a pig or my teenage daughter is as filthy as a pig in her bedroom. Uh, we, we talk about filth and gluttony, um, but we, and those are, those are traits humans share. It's why we make those illusions, but pigs are a lot like us in many other ways. They're, they're omnivores, so they can survive in many different situations. Uh, they're intelligent, they're adaptable, they are fierce, they're affectionate, uh, they're quarrelsome. Uh, a lot like us. And what I'm inviting you to do today is to think that maybe we've shaped pigs a little bit in our own image. When we look at them and we make those jokes and we talk about the, uh, the gluttony or the filth or the intelligence, maybe we're looking in a mirror. And I'll just give you a quick example. You know, think about hundreds of years ago when European settlers came to North America uh, the world they lived in was one of a lot of physical labor. It was done outside. Uh, and, and where I'm going here is that pigs and people shared a lot of experiences. Let's think this through just a little bit. Um, the work of making a living done outdoors. It was a world in which the diet that people ate was highly seasonable and highly variable. There were periods of feast and famine. Uh, it was a time where uh, there's a lot of physical work. It was a time uh, of using multiple food sources. Uh, it was a time of great mortality in which people died across the lifespan at a different rate than we do today. Uh, today, we think of real risky years as the infant period, teenage years, and then the post-55 years. Uh, and it's, it's quite shocking and bracing when someone younger dies 
Uh, but for the, the people of 400 years ago, death was constant across the lifespan. Uh, and much of the medical care that those people had was oriented towards treating symptoms rather than causes. Now, things change for people. Um, you know, we now live less rural, we live in cities. Now we're not exactly bumping into each other on the streets of Mason City, uh, but we are living in a much more densely populated world than we were, uh, an urban world. Uh, we aren't as evenly spread across the country as we were even 50 years ago. Our work has changed. So much less of our work is physical. It's now involving sitting. Uh, our diet that we, it, it's indoors in climate controlled environments. And much of the food that we eat is pretty constant throughout the year. As long as you have a job and, and insurance, you're getting regular food and you're getting decent medical care. And think about the pigs. They've mirrored that transition. Pigs today don't forage on their own. They have a diet that's relatively constant. They live in climate control uh, to varying degrees. Uh, they have access to medical care. Just like us who expect to live to three score and 10, uh, those pigs expect, can expect to live a lifespan until they're butchered. Uh, we don't see the same kinds of mortality that we saw three, 400 years ago. And what I'm, where I'm going with this is, the pig's experience mirrors our own. And we've projected a lot of our uh, desires and interests onto the backs of those animals. So uh, again, that's a little bit of a transition to the subject. We're gonna dive in now that we're uh, 10 minutes into our, our gathering, we're gonna dive into the nitty gritty uh, of, this, uh, of this subject. And I wanna start with that transition for pigs from being largely outdoor animals to being indoor. And in particular, not just indoor, but conceived of differently. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, people began to think of pigs and uh, postulate them as a factory or as a machine. Uh, and the, the machine's purpose was to convert uh, sugar, carbohydrates into flesh, uh, not just meat, but also fat. And that transition around the turn of the 20th century uh, was quite monumental. I, I say it's making an industrial pig rather than a uh, pastoral pig. Uh, and here I've got a little illustration on the uh, left that shows just the ways in which people started talking about pigs. They used the word management, and that's, that's pretty significant change that gets us to where we are. Uh, you know, for long periods of time, pigs spent their lives outdoors, they were grazing, they were finding their own food, and they were brilliant at it. And then in the fall, uh, in the corn growing areas of uh, what became the United States, it was very common to harvest ears of corn for the family. Uh, it was a 150 years ago was a time when people ate a lot more corn in terms of corn meal than we do today. They'd harvest some of the ears out, and then they would let livestock run in the field in the fall. Uh, it was a process called hogging down. And uh, it, it wasn't bizarre to see this uh, in the Midwest uh, just a generation ago. We see a lot less of it now. But uh, it was a labor-saving device uh, to, uh, to get your animals to put on weight and get them ready for market. Another way to do that was to uh, harvest the corn and put it in these fence rail pens you can see there in the middle the, the coming together of these sections of split log to make a, make a little storage unit. And the ear corn is piled in it. The pigs are put in larger enclosures, even the size of a football field. And there might be multiple uh, corn pens in here. And then the people who are doing the management will come in and kick off some of those ears of corn so the pigs can uh, get into it and meter it out. That was very common in the mid 19th century uh, as settlement moved into the Ohio Valley, into the Mississippi Valley. This was a way of bringing animals together from many different farms. Uh, people would go out to the countryside and buy up small lots of pigs and bring them into these large encampments. And after the pigs were fattened over the course of the fall would then be driven on foot 
to markets and those markets were Louisville and they were Cincinnati and they were Detroit and they were Cleveland and they were Ottumwa and they were Keokuk. Uh, these large hog drives, those were the, the places where the pork packing season began and the pork packing was a winter season because you needed the cold weather and the ice and there was space in all those city factories uh, or and warehouses that was being unused during the winter time. So this was a way of bringing animals together from many, many remote points, and it was risky. As we see today, uh, when you start bringing lots of people together from different areas, you bring lots of different animals, you created a disease vector. And one of those great diseases that in the 1850s started decimating hogs across the United States, including Iowa, was hog cholera, a disease that was understood as being highly transmissible, uh, but it was difficult to come up with an explanation for what it was in the 1850s. And I think it's quite interesting that the United States government, long before it embarked on public health measures for people, began a public health campaign for animals. And there were two animals, uh, cattle, the uh, concern about Texas fever, which was a transmissible uh, disease, and hog cholera. Again, hundreds of thousands of animals killed every year by these diseases. And the US government, through the Bureau of Animal Industries, set up a station to begin to investigate this in Ames, Iowa. Uh, this photograph that you're seeing here is uh, from the uh, swine, uh, the hog cholera testing station that was not far from the Skunk River in Ames. Uh, it was the place where the first, uh, the first uh, developed serum for inoculating hogs against hog collar was developed in the late 19th and early 20th century under the guidance of Dr. Marion Dorset. But all of these animals that were kept in these pens were uh, infected and then uh, often given the serum, the uh, hog collar serum to see they were infected and they drew the infected blood to create the serum that was used uh, to uh, create a prophylaxis for uh, hog cholera. That work was done in Iowa. And uh, to describe the scene the way I saw it in the primary sources, people talked about the fall of the year being like a war zone. Uh, along all the roads heading into major American cities, uh, certainly in the heartland, uh, thousands and thousands of hog carcasses uh, kicked off the road into the ditches, the stench. People described it like a war zone, a battlefield. And it was a grisly, grisly scene that encountered travelers on the roads in the late 19th century, well into the 20th century, um, before hog cholera was, was brought under control. Other forms of sanitation, uh, the McLean system developed in McLean County, Illinois, was one that emphasized prevention and cleanliness. They called it the swine sanitation system. And here's an illustration from uh, the late 20s or early 30s depicting the uh, system being practiced in the American South. Uh, the McLean system recognized that as pigs developed these transmissible diseases, they were often left in the very ground where they lived. And so part of the McLean sanitation system said, we need to be moving pigs regularly. The places where those sows give birth or farrow shouldn't be the same place where they've spent a lot of the rest of the year. So the McLean system uh, emphasized rotational grazing, moving places, uh, they didn't know why, they didn't understand the nature of all those pathogens at the time, uh, and it emphasized a lot of elbow grease with using lye and brushes to clean uh, all of the dwellings, the, these little A-frame huts or farrowing sheds. Uh, they, it required a lot of family labor on the part of farmers to use those brushes, lye water, and, and subsequently chemicals to uh, make a, a sanitary environment that would result in less disease transmission. One of the interesting things about hog husbandry is, again, this bringing together of many, many animals. Uh, this is a photograph from the J.C. Allen collection. I believe it's Illinois. 
uh, in which at harvest time, this is a October, November photograph, uh, you can see self feeders there in the upper left and in the uh, in the center with the hogs all facing in to where the corn is. Uh, people started bringing these animals in together in small lots to uh, make it more efficient to feed. And they started using concrete after World War II. It was experimented with in the 1920s, but this system becomes known as confinement. And we've used the word confinement systems for hog husbandry in the late 20th century. Uh, this is the beginnings of it, where pigs are brought together in lots uh, and those are paved lots that makes the feeding more efficient. There's less grain ground into the ground and wasted. Those pigs spend less time up to their bellies in the fall mud. Uh, it enables them to convert corn to uh, flesh at a much better rate. Uh, confinement will go through a couple different iterations until by the 1990s, we will see in this Illinois photograph. Uh, again, it's, it's really managing the animals from birth to death indoors. Uh, there are different kinds of barns built for confinement systems. Some of them are for uh, pre-gestation. Some of them are gestational. Some of them are farrowing. Some of them are for those very, very young pigs as soon as they're weaned. Uh, then there are others for different stages of their lives. And this is a gain in efficiency. And I want to circle back to where we started with this section, which is treating animals as if they're machines. And that mentality, uh, I think, also reflects a little bit about us when we think about how we control our own body weight. Uh, we look at input and output, burning calories versus consuming calories. Uh, this, is, this is a case where we're looking at animals in a new way in this time period. And I'd say that also mirrors how we're looking at ourselves, how we look at our own health and how we look at our diet. I wanna change gears a little bit for part two of three parts and talk a little bit about waste. Uh, I've given you two images here to uh, ponder. One on the left is from 1859 and it was depicting a scene in New York City, uh, the area really north of Central Park. And it's repeated in Brooklyn, it's repeated in uh, various points in New Jersey in which adjacent to large urban centers, uh, waste disposal was becoming an increasing problem. For hundreds of years, it was relatively easy to dump any and all waste, and, and people at that time produced far less waste than we do. Just to give you a quick example there, if you've read Dickens and some of these other, Alexandre Dumas, you know that cities were filled with people engaged in uh, historic recycling, rag pickers. Uh, rag pickers would take every scrap of fabric and it would be converted to uh, paper. It could be in, converted to menstrual cloth. It could be uh, converted to any number of things once that fiber is broken down. Uh, so cans, as cans become important in the 1840s and 50s, those cans are recycled. Uh, it's not new to think about recycling. It's just that for a long time, we forgot about it uh, in our relative affluence. So during this time period, uh, when cities are producing lots of waste, especially around urban businesses like breweries, uh, which create a lot of byproduct from the grain, the brewer's mash, uh, it's a place where there are slaughtering industries. What happens to that waste? Well, in most cities, there became a district concentrated where there were lots of pigs. And that brewer's waste, the uh, offal from slaughtering operations was fed to pigs. And the value there was that the pigs could in fact be subsequently used. Uh, so the pork that was generated from that had a value. So we were taking things that didn't have value or very little value and making them into something with value. But these became quite obnoxious as those cities were growing and New York was growing in a hurry in the 1840s and 50s, uh, these piggeries became quite obnoxious to sensibilities, not only of the olfactory system, but also 
just the idea of what a good clean city could be. Could a city be sanitary if it had these kinds of what, what were labeled as disease breeding grounds? And so cities took on a lot of work to push these piggeries farther and farther from, from the cities. And in fact, in 1859, there was a pig war in which the police and public health officials actually drove, they were providing citations to these piggeries, but the piggeries were making too much money to move. And ultimately uh, they were driven out in these campaigns by uh, deputies and uh, uh, public health uh, officials assisted by the sheriffs and the police. Uh, so waste is a significant problem and pigs were part of the solution. Uh, I've given you something here on the right from World War I. This is from the National Agricultural uh, Library and the USDA created it, talking about waste. And when the First World War came, uh, everyone was concerned about waste. Our own Herbert Hoover, of course, was trying to direct uh, as much food as possible to not only the fighting men of the United States and the uh, Entente, but also uh, to civilians for food aid. And so waste became a critical concern during World War I. You'll notice that this uh, poster says, don't give good quality waste human food to pigs. Uh, but the great irony here is that the use of uh, human food for pigs got a rapid boost during World War I. All of the restaurant trade produced lots and lots of waste, and that uh, waste was increasingly seen as being good for making into pork. So around World War I, uh, all of this conversion of waste into food got a real shot in the arm. And over the course of the next 20 to 30 years, feeding garbage to pigs becomes wildly popular across the United States. Every region does it. This is a, a photograph from the Los Angeles Public Library of a place called Fontana Farms that had tens of thousands of pigs on its property eating the garbage of Los Angeles. And they, you can see the rail line that runs uh, diagonally across this picture and the large uh, pens, these are all at feeding time. So you can see the animals are in the pens closest to the railways and the shelters for shade um, are back to the, uh, on the backside, but they've brought the pigs close to the rail lines and you can see the steam shovel dropping food into the, or dropping garbage into these pens. Uh, this is a common practice. It's put on an industrial scale here in Los Angeles, but it's done by truck it's done by train, uh, it's done by cart uh, across the United States. Feeding garbage to pigs becomes very, very popular. Uh, here's a detailed view of that uh, steam shovel at work here, dropping the, the waste directly onto the backs of the pigs. The pigs don't seem to care. Uh, but again, this is approximately 1935. Fontana Farms operated well into World War II. Here's an interesting one to me. This is Oklahoma City, uh, a hog pen adjacent to the dump. And I don't know if you can see it, but on the right-hand side, there's a fence line that runs from top to bottom. Uh, and on the right side, you can see lots and lots of garbage. And sometimes this garbage will be dumped into the, uh, into the hog lots here. But again, uh, this was an an active business. Uh, individuals and companies would get contracts with American cities to uh, run garbage feeding businesses. Uh, it's interesting though, as automobiles became more popular, uh, you'll remember from your Iowa History 101 that uh, the first people to really take to cars aside from the very wealthy were farmers. But as more and more city dwellers get cars after World War II, uh, it's possible to live farther and farther from the city center. So the suburban growth that we see around every major city today and kind of take for granted as natural, uh, that's really a post-World War II phenomenon as it's linked to cars. Uh, it turns out these dump sites are very valuable for housing developments. So uh, as, uh, as people get greater mobility and developers start buying up this land, uh, the 
uh, garbage feeding operations are pushed farther and farther from the city center. Most of them will die though in the 1950s and 60s as we see increasing concerns about uh, trichinosis. And if you're like me and you grew up in the 70s, you know that we typically cooked pork, uh, not to a crisp, but that had to be well cooked all the way through. And what I heard from my mother who was a home economics teacher was that we don't want trichinosis. It's a horrible, horrible thing to endure. And she was right, of course. Uh, but the trichinosis uh, threat was primarily from that pork that was linked to garbage feeding operations. And you can see it here. This is from 1941, when that cycle of the parasite, the trichina worm, uh, the, the rats eat it, rats uh, die, consume other dead rats, pigs consume the dead rats, uh, and uh, that is passed through this cycle of hogs uh, feeding on uncooked garbage that might have had trichina worms in it from the pork. And of course, the aggregator is people. And there's a great concern about trichinosis in the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s. Uh, the only way to get rid of it is to cook meat to a high temperature. And uh, again, it's not really a threat from beef because the beef are eating primarily plants. But because those pigs like us are omnivores, we uh, share a lot of the same virtues and a lot of the same, uh, the same problems. So the, the interest in controlling the trichina worm uh, really leads to a series of laws that swept the country in the 1950s, that if you are going to feed garbage to pigs, it has to be cooked first. And cooking the waste is expensive. And so it cuts into the margins uh, that people saw. People saw the real value that garbage, which is free, could be made into something valuable. But if you have to cook it, that involves equipment, a capital investment. That involves a labor investment. And so most garbage feeders by the 1960s have phased out of business. There's still some places where it happens. Um, and there may be great potential for it in the future but uh, the costs associated with converting uh, food waste into uh, uh, food became prohibitive for most people by the 1960s. If you can believe it, we're ready for part three. I don't know if you need a drink uh, to get a glass of water, but uh, don't worry, the, the meeting is recorded. Uh, so if you need to get up, don't worry about missing part three. Uh, part three is about making a lean pig. And I want to touch back to the beginning where I said we project a lot of ourselves onto animals. Uh, I would say this is a good example that in our interest in health that is linked to diet, it's linked to exercise, um, we've changed the animals that we consume um, uh, many, many times. So I call this lard to lean, which is taking an animal that not so long ago was prized for not just having meat, but having a high, uh, high content of subcutaneous fat that could be rendered down to make something very valuable, which is lard. And in some cases, lard was more valuable than pork. Uh, again, there's this relationship that moves back and forth. Uh, but we decided at one point that we didn't need the lard anymore. And really this is a, a 1930s and 40s uh, beginning where there's a lot of discourse about uh, obesity. And a lot of it has to do with some of the changes that are starting in American society as we uh, are on the cusp of becoming a nation that's more middle-class than working class in which middle-class people tend to sit to work and working class people uh, are, are using strong backs and strong legs and uh, calluses on their hands. This is a case in which the economy is linked to our diet. And there's a concern that we're eating too much fat. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just make a quick allusion to the 1970s again. This was a time when cholesterol uh, becomes a deal. And if, uh, 
if you are paying paying attention to congressional reports, particularly the McGovern report about linking red meat consumption, excessive red meat consumption to heart disease, uh, concerns about cholesterol, uh, we see the rise of egg substitutes. And oleomargarine margarine gets a boost uh, during the 1970s. We invent light beer. People start taking salads seriously. Uh, jogging, which had existed, becomes a craze in the 1970s. Uh, we even have a, a president who jogs, uh, President Jimmy Carter. Uh, that, If you were around at the time, that was quite bracing that a president would do that. Um, and that's tied to pigs. Uh, there's a great connection. I, I'm giving you a little down here in the right, on the right half. Uh, I've got what's labeled as a land pike hog, the kind of hog that was typical in, in settlement areas, uh, a hog that was fast, a hog that could shift for itself very well, uh, to improved breeding, which is the next image over to the right. That's an 1840s uh, engraving that shows kind of an ideal pig, a pig that would produce a lot of lard. And, and again, I should note lard, not just for cooking, but lard for lubrication in the industrial machinery. We don't have an oil revolution in the United States till the 1850s. Um, so for a long time, lard is an industrial lubricant to reduce uh, uh, the, the temperature of metal on metal from the new steam revolution. Uh, lard is also valuable for lighting your homes. Uh, just as there's whale oil lamps, there are also lard oil lamps that you can, uh, that you can use. So again, that lard has a real economic value, a real cultural value. And then down below is a hog pictured around the turn of the century, um, uh, Longfellow Premier, a, a sire uh, from a herd book. And again, these, these animals, uh, a, an old friend of mine, Mike Whitmer always used to say there were potatoes with little legs coming out of them. Uh, again, there was a reason why those hogs were made to carry a lot of weight. Uh, corn was especially good for that because corn is a high sugar crop uh, compared to other, other grains. Uh, but in this period, in the 20th century, people start getting a little touchy about uh, fat. And I put on the left-hand side, the National Pork Board uh, issues uh, and has issued these standards to which breeding could be uh, conformed. And so you see a very different kind of animal, one that looks a lot more like the land pike, one that does not have three to four inches of subcutaneous fat and lots of intramuscular fat, but an animal that has little or no uh, subcutaneous fat and very little intramuscular fat. Uh, that becomes a goal. And it's a goal in which farmers and pork packers and new organizations like the Pork Producers Council, both at the state level and the national level, uh, they do a great job of this. They are very successful in remaking the pig again from being one that valued fat to one that valued lean. Uh, lots of people are in on this campaign very quickly. This is a 4-H exhibit uh, from North Carolina. Uh, it's in the collections of North Carolina State University, but here you're contrasting that carcass, one that has more meat, one that has more fat. And the message here is, consumers prefer leaner pork. Uh, this is also tied to the use after World War II of uh, cellophane wrapping. Uh, so consumers can actually not go to the butcher's case and point at something, but they can actually pick up that product and look it over and examine it for fat. And that's a very different encounter than pointing in the butcher's case uh, to which cut you would like. Uh, just a, very quickly, uh, perhaps the most important historic artifact you've never heard of is pictured here in the upper left. It's a small ruler called the back fat probe. And as the industry was looking to make hogs leaner, uh, it was very difficult to assess how much fat is on the carcass unless you can see the carcass and cut it open, like in that last picture. Well, that of course means the hog has to be dead. And it means that if there is a carcass that has very little lean, that genetic material has been eliminated. So how do you find out how much fat an animal has while it's living? This little ruler 
developed at Iowa State by uh, Lenoy Hazel, uh, allowed you to do that. So with a, a little scalpel, you can make an incision above a couple points on the vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae, uh, above the, uh, the shoulders, and uh, you can make a slight incision there, and you can record how much back fat's there. So if farmers could bring together lots of young boars, and they did so at swine testing stations in Ohio, Tennessee, Iowa, every place across the country, you could test boars. So farmers could bring a lot of boars in, and the testing station would control their diet, and find out which animals were most likely to have the, less, the least body fat. And those boars would be picked up by the farmers, taken back, and used as the seed stock uh, for breeding. Uh, so that, this is a, an ingenious little tool here, uh, the back fat probe. Now we can use lots of other tools. Uh, ultrasound is one, uh, so you, there's no incision. Uh, but uh, in the upper right there, you can see what that uh, process wrought. So the old fashioned lard type to the modern meat type hog. Uh, this uh, book down here, this image in the lower left is from a book by uh, Professor Richard Wilhelm who was on the Iowa State faculty for many, many years and, and really a, a generous, generous person. Uh, I enjoyed conversations with him when he was working with Living History Farms. So it's it's great to uh, be reminded of those friendships when you're doing your research. Uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, pork producers are trying to market to a, it, in a very uh, difficult climate in which more and more people see chicken as healthy and pork repositions itself. In 1983, pork, the national pork producers uh, create the America you're leaning on pork theme that uh, used uh, Dorothy Hamill, the Olympic uh, figure skater, or Olympic uh, figure skater as a, as a spokesperson. Uh, in 1989, the iconic campaign, uh, The Other White Meat, again, associating pork with something that was perceived to be healthier, chicken. The great irony in all this is that as we stripped out all of that fat out of the pork carcass. Uh, it made pork a difficult dining proposition. Uh, again, if you grew up in the 70s and you were concerned about trichina and you're cooking pork at a high temperature for a long period of time that doesn't have much fat in it, the inevitable result is pork that tastes a little like shoe leather. Uh, so there is a bit of a swing back in the 80s and 90s uh, to fattier pork that became known in the industry parlance as heritage pork. And accompanying that was a real resurrection of bacon. Bacon, which in the 70s had been a real loser, the industry called it a drag on the carcass. But in the 1980s, fast food firms uh, led by Hardee's and others uh, start putting a lot of bacon on their burgers. And many people find it to be delicious. Bacon gets a bit of a renaissance as we see the rise of uh, the Food Network and other uh, uh, gastronomically inclined television programming and magazines uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, people start getting interested in bacon again and pork belly. And of course, if, you, if you're in Des Moines or Central Iowa, you know a little bit about the ways in which bacon has been enshrined and lionized with uh, festivals. Uh, Des Moines not alone. Uh, there are many of these across the United States that provide a, an opportunity for people to uh, sample different kinds of bacon as well as just uh, engorge on it. Uh, but this is a case where bacon has emerged in the 21st century uh, as an unlikely, uh, unlikely cut of the pork carcass that uh, has given, has rejuvenated the pork industry. And what I want to do next is uh, pause for a minute. I, I now show that it's 16 minutes till the hour and we promise to have about 15 minutes for Q and A. Um, I, I put this little image here from the Chicago Tribune. This is actually from an article about trichinosis 
and you have the uh, man in his gray flannel suit uh, looking at the pork, uh, looking at the hog, wondering what kind of pork am I going to get? Will it have trichinosis in it? Uh, so it's just a, a little uh, side, side image there, but I do want to make sure there's time for questions. So I'll yield to my old friend, Leo. Well, thank you, Joe. And we do have time for questions, as you have said. And so to remind our audience, you can submit those through the Q&A feature in Zoom. And uh, I'll look for those. We may not be able to get to all the questions, but I'll start with this one. With the current focus on farm to table, and you talked a little bit about this, uh, but farm to table food, uh, how do you see that uh, branding around pork impacting pigs and hog farming in the US? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, thank you also for, for joining today. Uh, farm to table has very significant consequences. And, and the issue of branding, uh, and, and I want to make sure the distinction is made between branding and what's real. Uh, lots and lots of uh, companies have been attempting to create brands around uh, farm to table. Some of them are more faithful to the farm to table ethic than others. Uh, but the idea of farm to table, I think, is a tremendous growth area for the industry. Uh, you know, we have tended to look at the industry as a one size fits all. Um, it, for a long time, we were learning that efficiency is only possible at large scale. And, uh, you know, a lot of the work of economists, including some at Iowa State, have said that's actually not always true. Efficiency can be gained at a smaller scale, especially if you're offering something to that's in a, a different niche. So I think farm to table has tremendous potential in the livestock industry. Um, I'm not sure the uh, pace at which that will happen, but I, I'll confess I was surprised at how quickly it came on in the uh, early 20, 21st century here. So I think there's a lot of growth and I think there's great potential for uh, making a, an ethical meat industry, um, making, taking and dealing with some of the externalities of our of our current our current industry which does an amazing job in many ways and also leaves a lot to be desired very good thank you uh here's another one regarding the words capitalist what effect have pigs had on the american and if you want to speak to canadian as well but on the u.s and canadian economy in comparison to other meat sources so pigs versus other meat sources in the US and Canadian economies. Yes, and, and my disclaimer is, is that uh, I, I claim no expertise in Canadian history or the Canadian economy other than my lived experience here since 2008. But certainly in the United States economy, uh, pigs have been central to the meat industry and agriculture in general. And one of the things I didn't talk about was the changing fortunes of pork in the diet in the American diet. Uh, all that effort to rebrand pork as a, a lean meat and to remake the carcass into a lean one, again, it was remarkably successful. The failure of that campaign was that pork consumption stayed relatively steady. Uh, and I guess there's a glass half full and a glass half empty side to that. Pork in relationship to beef uh, had been fairly consistent, but the, the dark horse was chicken. And again, chicken with a relatively short lifespan, it's, it's easy to intervene in that. Uh, you know, the gestational period for pigs is fast, three months, three weeks, three days, but chickens uh, much faster. So you can make changes at the whole organism level much faster. So chicken led the way and chicken was the primary beneficiary of subtherapeutic antibiotics and some new breeding techniques. And so pork, the pork industry, watching chicken consumption surge was really playing a game of catch up. And so, like I said, it's half empty or half full. The lean pork campaign didn't push 
pork consumption up dramatically, but the glass half full is that pork didn't lose relative to beef and pork consumption in aggregate stayed relatively steady. Uh, so yes, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yes, the byproducts from the hog carcass are exceptionally valuable. And I noticed recently in the news, there's been new work in xenotransplantation, the use of uh, pig organs in, for human therapies. Uh, this has been a, I, I talk about it a little bit in the book and it looks like there may be some recent breakthroughs that make the use of things like pig hearts uh, and other organs uh, more viable for human therapies uh, if we choose to go down that road as a society. I, I know that I could, you could write a book on your question, but I just am trying to give you a, a couple little tidbits there. Well, and I'm so glad you brought in the xenotransplantation with the, that being in the news. So thanks for re referencing that. Uh, another question is, and I know you talk about this in the book a bit, but how does spam fit into the story of pork uh, connected to World War One and World War II? If yes, uh, tinned meat, thank you for asking that. Tinned meat is a, is a big deal. And spam has a distinct cultural place. Uh, it's, it's so unfortunate that uh, an email, a, an unsolicited email is spam. Uh, it, it really indicates a, a distinct cultural prejudice like so many of the prejudices against pigs, filthy gluttonous, uh, that, uh, that is undeserved. Uh, because wh what is spam? Spam is the cuts of shoulder and many other, many other pork shoulder, uh, which is, I mean, personally a delicious cut, uh, lots of other pieces with a lot of salt and seasoning. I mean, that's a, that's a recipe that, that many humans really like, uh, things, things with salt. Uh, so spam, uh, has been derided through its association now with uh, email, but spam is a big deal. Spam was especially valuable in the 1930s and 40s. And I'll just mention a quick example of the 40s. Uh, it was one of those meats that people working in the defense industries, which was virtually everyone, uh, aside from uh, healthcare practitioners and education, uh, lots and lots of people were working in the defense industries. It was a time in which teenagers were dropping out of high school because there was so much money to be made and it was relatively easy to get a shift when factories are working 24 hours a day uh, in the defense industries. Spam was an easy meal uh, for people working in defense industries. Spam was the kind of thing you could open the can, get your cast iron skillet out, put a little glaze on that very, very quickly and uh, meet your calorie needs to do all of that physical defense work. So very important, uh, just a side note, uh, companies like Hormel, the, the, spam, uh, the spam people, but other meat packers also developed tinned products during World War II. One of them was for export. Uh, the people in the Soviet Union had a tinned pork product called Tushanka. And it was a recipe uh, that the American producers got and started making it because the United States was providing a significant share of food for people in the Soviet Union at that time, uh, which went from enemy to ally uh, overnight uh, when Hitler invaded uh, the Soviet Union. So uh, spam consumed on the battlefront, but even more important on the home front, people in Britain, in the areas that had been occupied like the Netherlands, uh, as allied forces moved in there, tinned pork became a huge part of their diet. Uh, and spam to this day, uh, Pacific Islanders have a special fondness for, uh, for spam. It, uh, it's, it's lionized there while it's degraded elsewhere. Very good. Thank you. We might have time for two more, I'm hoping. So this one may be a quick one or maybe not. Uh, you've shared a lot of great stories. And what's something that uh, that you had to take out of the talk today that you found uh, to be most interesting in researching this topic? 
there are a couple of things. I, one of the things that I did not fully appreciate in the post-World War II expansion of uh, hog culture, really into the Great Plains, kind of the dislocation. Yeah, there, there are many maps that show how, you know, Eastern Nebraska, Iowa, Southern Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Western Ohio, North Missouri, all these places, you know, the Corn Belt for a long time was the Hog Belt. And what is interesting and what I didn't fully appreciate the life that was happening around me in the 1980s and 90s is the way uh, that was moving to the West. And it was moving to the West for a couple of reasons, uh, long pr prolonged periods of low corn prices uh, made, made it easier to move corn rather than having to have it close to your feeding operation. Uh, and the other thing was the buildup of soil pathogens. When people are looking to the Dakotas and not just Eastern uh, South Dakota, but Western South Dakota, when people are looking at Oklahoma to expand uh, into large scale pork producing, one of the things that came with that was the green field, which was moving into that area meant you're, you're leaving an area that has a buildup of soil pathogens that can damage your bottom line. And I didn't fully appreciate that. And, and the way that the Ogallala Aquifer was providing the water for not only the drinking water for those pigs, but the millions of gallons for waste removal uh, in the Great Plains. So that was something that uh, I didn't really know how and why that was happening when, when it was happening. Very good. And this is a, a topic, and this will be our last question, I'm pretty sure, Joe. Uh, as you begin the book, you talk about how Native nations saw hogs coming into uh, their lands and what that meant to them. And so you cover that pretty well in the American South and, and New England in the uh, colonial period. Did you come across any evidence in the Midwest of uh, how Native nations felt about hogs? I saw very little evidence on that. That's a good question. Uh, but I do know that at the time period that Iowa is on the cusp of being settled, uh, this is a, a, an ongoing problem in the more easterly regions. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, the way the treaties roll out, the way... Uh, Native American removal rolls out in the 1830s uh, that I think makes it perhaps a little less of a flashpoint uh, in the uh, in the Midwest in the Upper Midwest. Uh, it's a it's a good question, and I'm trying to think that there's a, maybe a reason for that is that by the time Iowa is being settled, the indigenous people in Iowa. Uh, are very few in number. And the, one of the reasons to, to think about that is the ongoing effects of the diseases that ravaged indigenous communities. So, you know, the, the Iowa population by the time 1843 rolls around is, is relatively small. Uh, someone can give me an exact number, but it's, uh, it's a very small population. So I think there are fewer flashpoints uh, in, in large part because there are fewer people. I think that's a really credible uh, explanation. And so with that answer, that's going to bring our webinar to a close today. I want to say thank you so much to Joe. It's been fun to be uh, just a small part of this program and uh, know that you're always happy to uh, hear of new sources and uh, new evidence on, on any topic on Midwestern and, and United States agriculture. And I know we all can say this has been a, a great way to learn about hogs and uh, their role in United States cultural history. So thank you. We want to thank everyone else for joining us today. We hope you will sign up for our upcoming Iowa History 101 webinars that take place every week in March, which is Iowa History Month and then will take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the rest of the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. 
For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. While you are there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Stories series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. We look forward to virtually seeing you Thursday, March 10th, as we continue Iowa History Month programming for 2022. Thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you, Joe, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you.